Former President Goodluck Jonathan states that Nigeria's woes are traumatizing. And confusion in Anambra State's PDP as two candidates emerge as winners in the parallel PDP governorship primaries. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anako. Former President Goodluck Jonathan has said the rising insecurity, poor economy and other vices bedeviling the nation were worsening mental health, as most Nigerians have become traumatized by the happenings in the country. He deplored cultism in schools and how it is compounding the prevailing security situation in Africa's most populous nation, Nigeria. The ex-president observed that most areas of the nation's health system needed to be upgraded to international standards. Well, joining us to have a conversation on these issues is Olawale Okuni, his Director General of Nigeria Intervention Movement, NIM, and Tanko Yunusa, National Chairman of the National Conscience Party, NCP. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Great. Uh, I'm going to start with you, uh, Mr. O o Okuni. Um, you obviously work with uh, an intervention movement. And one of the first things that former President Goodluck Jonathan uh, pointed to was the fact that the reason why we're having so many cults-related activities in schools is that these young persons have taken to drugs. So let's start with that. Um, how did we get to this point where the young children, I mean, I have seen a group of young boys who, uh, I think that video went viral, um, who were taking um, drugs and they were taking pills, you know, to get high. And a few minutes later, they were all just, you know, rolling in the mud and literally had lost their mind. A lot of people would point fingers at the, the home front. Some would say it's societal pressure, but hey, we're dealing with banditry, we're dealing with cultism and we're dealing with drug abuse. This is a potpourri of issues, but how did we get here? Thank you. Um, it's really unfortunate that uh, the country has gone into this abyss. Uh, it's, um, it's really very sad that people want happiness. Uh, human beings naturally want happiness one way or the other. And the conditions are tough. At the own front, the parents cannot cope anymore with um, um, sustaining or getting means of livelihood for their children. And so people want just an escape route. People just want a route out of the traumatizing situation that we have uh, found ourselves. And so people resort to, to, to drugs to find some soccer, you know, where well, there is peer pressure, ethnic peer, peer group pressure and the rest. But then, I mean, it, um, for, for me, I think that people just want some comfort, some solace, just to make themselves, and then, you know, they get introduced to drugs. The parents could no, no longer afford, you know, um, to take care of their children, and then, the children are, are, are more comfortable in the midst of their, their peers. I mean, some of them who are well to do from, from well to do homes. So these are factors. These are, this, this is a cycle that, um, um, that is leading us to a drug, you know, this very dangerous um, situation of having to abuse drugs. So uh, I think President Jonathan is not uh, really, really out of place when he talked about this, this the, the situation of the country is quietly, quite traumatizing. And then people are looking for escape routes, which we have. To. And so people resort to drugs, people resort to uh, um, group, uh, uh, peer uh, pressure, and so on and so forth. So that, that's my take. Uh, it's unfortunate. Hmm. It's really 
need. Uh, even, even older people are into drugs. Uh, even when you see uh, the state of insecurity, those who are uh, very much engaged in this resort to drug one way or the other. Mm. So we really need have to do something about our economy. Uh, we need to do something. If we're able to do something about our economy, that will get reduced. Thank you. Okay, let's 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 continue to. I'm pressing. I'm building up to where we're going to. Um, now you have mentioned that even the guys that are involved now. I, like I said at the beginning, we have banditry, we have kidnapping, we have Boko Haram, and the rest of it. And at its core is drug abuse. Now, the NDLEA recently had proposed that um, there's going to be a drug test of sorts for people who are preparing to get into marriage and that it might help to ascertain the state, the mental state of people uh, who want to get married to avoid, you know, um, whatever kinds of you know actions that might be detrimental to that union but of course there are also people who kick against it it should we wait till it's married there have been people who have also proposed that we have to test our politicians our police officers and not just drug tests but also to check their mental uh, well-being to be sure that these people are fit for offices so but in case in terms of the, these drug tests um alcohol tests should also be part of it because we have seen police officers on duty, um, and some of them were under the influence. Uh, so should we wait till people want to get married to have these tests? Do we even necessarily have to have it as a rule of law of sorts? Well, I think if this writing is done, which is to solve our economic problem, we might overcome a lot of these problems. Uh, if we are able to provide for the citizens, if we're able to arrange ourselves well enough, we may be able to overcome this. How, uh, it, how, how do you deal with the economy? Uh, I'm sorry I'm sorry to speak over you. How do we deal with the economy when we are facing these hydra-headed monsters called insecurity? I mean, on every front, whether it be militancy or Boko Haram or the bandits, farmer herders clash, um, whether it be cultism in the South-South, uh, I mean... How do you deal with the economy when insecurity is rife? How are you going to get businesses up and running if you are having these issues left, right and center? And don't forget, the reason why the cost of living seems to be rising high and foodstuffs are now pretty expensive is because these farmers are unable to go to their farms and harvest their products uh, you know, in the safety, uh, you know, of the day, they literally need to pay security officers to go with them. So again, we know that insecurity is the basis of Nigeria's problems right now. But of course, we have other problems. So how do you want to do deal with the economy if you haven't dealt with insecurity? Is this not an offshoot? Yes, it is really, but they are intertwined. Uh, both the economy and the security situation. Uh, but fundamentally, we need to deal with the state of our union to be able to address the problem of insecurity and our economic woes or economic problem, the very terrible economic situation. The first thing to deal with for me is for Nigeria to build, to really structure in a way that we can have harmony cohesion and stability. If we are able to deal with the our constitutional foundation, we can overcome the problem of insecurity to a large extent. And then from there, we'll be able to deal with our economy and um, for, for foster what you call economic prosperity. Uh, it's unfortunate that Nigeria has been structured in a way that it will not bring about prosperity. It will not even bring about peace. There will be instability, there will be crisis. So you need to go back to the basis. You will need to deal with how the Nigerian peoples engage. The most Nigerian peoples for once must be allowed to take ownership of the country. Not that a, a, a China cartel of the ruling class will foist, you know, a, a, a constitutional structure that, that keeps making the people 
and servicing or serving them. So these are the problem where you have the tiny people holding the economy, the resources of the country at the jugular, and then they are not going to let go. But isn't that the idea one. of government? I mean, government is a handful of people leading, you know, the, the larger majority with the rule book of sorts, which is the constitution in this regard. Um, so, except you, you know, the fact that you said they will be holding Nigerians at the juggler. Uh, but of course, the office of the citizen is also a, a very powerful office. Um, could it be that we Nigerians do not really understand the powers that come with that office, hence the reason why we still seem to be at the mercy of this tiny majority who we call our leaders. Yeah, the way politics is structured in Nigeria makes it impossible for the majority to be able to do anything meaningful except by revolution. And that is why leaders of thought and conscience have been clamoring for constitutional re-engineering of the country. The way it is today is that the ruling class will continue to make the common patrimony of the people. And that is the structure you have. In which case, those who are in government and who control the state are super rich. Why the majority of the people are made paupers and beggars. And so they will resort to insecurity and drop. If you want to even do, you know, be violent, you look for certain things to help you. I mean, those who are recruited into that must go back. So it is a foundational problem with Nigeria. Okay. Go ahead. If we need to solve the symptom of drug abuse and, and so on and so forth, we must deal with our foundation. In which case, majority of Nigerians would have their welfare guaranteed under governance. Today, people are their own, you know, make their roads, they make their bones, they make their legs, they make everything. In, you know, government here in Nigeria is virtually um, absent in the life of people. And then you find the political class honoring the resources. And then you leave majority of Nigerians in abject poverty. So they will resort to anything. Okay. They will resort to their push to the world. I, I will come they back will to I will come back to you, Mr. Kuni. Let me go to Mr. Tanko Yunusa, who's on the phone. Uh, Mr. Yunusa, uh, just listening to the conversation we've been having, um, Mr. Kuni Okuni seems to be saying that government has failed the people. And President, former President Goodluck Jonathan is talking about the woes of Nigeria and how traumatizing it is for the average Nigerian. Uh, and, and I know that you live in Nigeria, so you know all of the things that we have been experiencing lately. Aside from insecurity, the cost of living is rising high. We are facing an inflation of sorts. The Naira is deeping on a, on a daily. Uh, and of course, you know, we are also dealing with issues of cultism and children um, getting more and more into that hall of drug abuse. Um, where do we even start to deal with this issue? Because it seems like uh, the plate of Mr. President and the federal government seems to be full. Well, like just like Wale has said earlier on, uh, we are facing a situation where in the country, where the uh, majority of Nigerians are so disappointed with the way in which leadership is being uh, propelled, and that really generated a lot of questions to be asked. I was watching the other day um, a video by former Minister of Agriculture, uh, Sir Audu Ugbe. He was giving analysis of how we missed the point and then we find ourselves in this situation as, at, as it were, economically, security-wise, and in terms of the unity of the country. Interestingly, he said he was a young minister at that time, that he found it difficult to understand why we have to open our borders for importation of goods and services. But while he was making those assertions, 
he was not supported because they felt he was speaking as a young person. But what I found interesting in that statement is this. At that point in time, we were able to identify the challenges that we have as a nation. But up to today, this is 34 years down the line. We have not been able to extract those particular problems apart from the fact that we devalue our Naira, we went ahead again to open our borders where we can take in goods and services, but we were not producing anything. Mm. And if you are a consumer nation, obviously what you have is indebtedness. And that is a situation where we find ourselves. We have been saying for a very long time that governance has left the people. The local government are not functioning very well. The people who are supposed to come closer to the local government are not feeling the impact of governance. And so they've let them follow open to insurgency. So anybody can use them for any kind of social malfeasance. So what we find at the moment is failure of leadership to identify the system breakdown and trying to mend it. Unfortunately, also, we have a president who have not come through for the people. Maybe towards the last uh, two years of his tenure, he's trying to show his cap capacity, but quite honestly, it is a little bit too late. So, but we can do one thing. We can get the people to believe that there is a country, and then we can still work together in trying to move and mend all the fences. Okay. But as we were, as we are today, we failed the people, the, the government has failed the people woefully, and we are only looking up to 2023, where people of impeccable character can be able to run for positions of power. Mr. Yunusa, I mean, it's interesting that you have to bring 2023 into the conversation, but it's two, ye two years away from 2023, and we're still dealing with people being abducted on a daily basis. I mean... Uh, for these bandits, it seems to become, uh, you know, a fun thing for them because it's happening every week, if not every day or every two days. They are taking people and they're certain that monies will be paid for them to release these students. But let's talk about people who have come up uh, or that this whole insecurity has thrown up. The likes of Sunday Boho, the likes of um, Sheikh Gumi, the likes of um, Namdi Khan, who's been reawoken. Uh, these voices seem to be very loud, even almost uh, at the same level with the voices of, you know, those in power. Um, and the question one would ask is, there's obviously a loophole and a leakage which has led to these voices becoming so powerful. And yet we are unable to deal with the issue of insecurity. For, for example, we have had a Sheikh Gumi who has, number one, asked for amnesty for Bandits. He has also asked that the CBN at some point pay um, or make available funds to give to mm. these kidnappers to release students who were kidnapped. He's also recently spoken about the fact that there's been a collusion between the army and these bandits. Uh, and one would wonder mm. who Sheikh Gumi is that he's saying all of these things and still walking free, uh, as opposed to a, in a Namdi Kanu who has been who's part of a, a, a group of people who've been proscribed several years ago. And then we also have a Sunday Woho who many have also frowned at the, some of the things that he has said. But there's been a reason why these men have been thrown up in the system because of insecurity. Why does there mm -hmm. seem to be a, a ping pong attitude as to how to deal with insecurity? And these men who are saying things that seem to be unnecessarily um, or rather insensitive, uh, especially for a time as this. Look, let, let, let us be frank. Had it been that the government has been up and doing, they've really been able to put pen to paper and say, look, we want to work on the economy of this country. We want to provide jobs. We want to provide food on the table of every Nigerian. We want to ensure that the country is secured. And many people are seeing this thing being done on a daily basis. There wouldn't have been any agitation by the likes of Nam Dekanu or the likes of Sunday Boho or even Chef Gumi, who is speaking from 
an uncontrolled position. I really don't understand how a clergyman will be speaking about abducting children and collecting money at the same time as justifying that situation. To me, it's totally unacceptable. And neither would I accept any idea from Enam Dekanu agitating and mobilizing people to be killed or our security apparatus like the policemen and all saying that they can go in, kill them, attack them. It's unacceptable. So, but all of this is gravitated towards the inability of the government to be able to deal with the issue ab initio. Let me give you an example. The situation that happened in Oyo, for example, happened in a village, uh, Iganga, for example, I'm sure that's the name of the village. What really happened was that there are governors who have been using machineries, using um, either full enhancement or local militias in order to gain power. They've armed these individuals with a lot of guns. They can't retrieve these guns anymore. Now, when the killing started, people now started looking for um, a respite. And so what did they do? They ended up in the hands of these same militias, which the governors have financed and empowered now to become their own security um, agents. Can you just imagine? Where is the police? Where is the army? Where is the NDSC? Where are the security agencies? That to show you because the government has failed in its responsibility to deal with these issues as they start. Uh, but before no. I go back, by, by the time, but before I go back to Mr. Kuni, I just want to push you further on something. You're saying, you, I mean, yes, the box stops at the table of our governments, whether they be federal or state or local government, but. Our security agents have been over and over, uh, they've claimed that they do not know where these bandits are. They, they, they kept feeding us that story. But then there's a Sheikh Gumi who has been able to go to these bandits again and again, accompanied by security operators. We have seen a video that has resurfaced. Um, that was the bombshell for me. So, so again, so it, it makes us really question. Going out, he goes out with the security apparatus. So obviously, what it means is that our security people know where the bandits are. So the question is, if our security agents, because I wanted to ask that question before you started talking, if our security agents know where the bandits are, what is the story that they're telling us, and why should we believe that story now that we've seen videos? of some of these security agents with very well-known bandits and killers. And, and there are people who are also criticizing the fact that we're still calling them bandits, that these are the people who are terrorizing our communities and they are terrorists. So what is the duty of people like you and Mr. Kuni, um, who are supposed to be leaders of thought and people who are pushing for good governance? Why are we still sitting on our hands on this issue, knowing that, uh, knowing what we know now? Why are we still very lackadaisical about this issue? For, for us, we're not in government. I have not held any position in governance since I started my struggle way back. But the truth about it is that I've been a strong advocate of an egalitarian society. I've been a strong advocate of a fair and equity society where every Nigerian has a right to play his, his businesses or aspire to be anybody in this country. And I've remained, we have remained consistent in that particular manner. So coming back to your question, with regard to the issue of identifying that our security agencies know where the bandits are, that is the internal conspiracy that we are facing. I've always said that there's an internal and external conspiracy against the Nigerian state. And the Nigerian state is suffering from that particular internal and external uh, 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 conspiracy which has now been extrapolated and been confirmed by Chegumi without his statement. If the security agencies have been following Chegumi out to anywhere he's going, then why couldn't they have organized themselves in getting rid of these particular people? If not that there's a conspiracy against the state. Okay. So I think Mr. President is not doing enough. He has not put the right people in the right places, and he has not been able to put his feet down to know exactly where the, the shoe pinches. But anyway, the time, the time is coming. They will have only two years left. Every Nigerian should go out and register to vote. 
you can't say you will not register to vote. Register and vote, not only for voting, but bring out the best candidate, not because of his money, but because of his track record, who can make changes in this society. Uh, Look, we don't have any other country. Uh, if you like, you want to visit Nigeria into 10 places. I will the same situation will come back. Part. I will come back to this because you're, you're really pulling my strings with the um track record issue I, I mean don't let me don't get me started on mr president but let me come back to you mr lawale okuni um that the issue of mr president and the federal government's strategy to handling um this insecurity issue is you know on the lips of everybody many have you know accused mr president of double standards um using a sledgehammer to kill an ant in the southeast and of course um, playing in kids' gloves in the north uh, and in north central, and of course uh, the northwest. So, um, just looking at what Mr. Yunusha has said, you know that there seems to be a collusion. And this is not the first time we're hearing it, even though Sheikh Gumi had to restate it. And of course, the army uh, has had had said that what he was saying, uh, or rather, they countered his statement. But a former a former serving um, um, security official. Um, had also said this, that there was some collusion at the time when we, before this issue became as big as this, at the time when we had the ham, uh, farmer, farmer herders clash, um, T.Y. Danjima had raised alarm about the fact that there was some form of collusion. And now the federal government seems to only pay lip service to this issue and not uh, acting as much as we would expect for, it, for them to handle. And with all of the things that we're seeing play out, uh, what, what, what is left for the common Nigerian to do uh, to get government to really get to work? Well, I, I think we have a complex situation on our hand. And then the state is very weak because it has lost a lot of ground in terms of legitimacy and popularity. And so it cannot deal with insurgency effectively. People today have resorted to self-help since government is not listening to the agitation and advocacy. And then government have become increasingly unpopular. And so that will generate tension and violence. And people like Gumi uh, are just being um, used, you know, because government itself is weak. They, they, they have no choice than to work with people like Gumi. In, in the north, uh, why people like uh, Namjikanu and Sunday Bugu um, will be, you know, naturally suppressed because of what they are calling for, which is um, secession, so to say. So we need to deal with government. I don't know whether this government will be able to deal with that. Uh, we, need, we can't go to election this way. If you go to election this way, you are going to have the same results. You dare not go to election. It will produce a far worse result. Because those who go into government, they go into government because of the juice of governance, money to serve themselves. And go government and politics have become the only thriving business in the country. So, and then it is do or die. It is politics of money bags and highest bidder. Hmm. You know, it is not politics of principle or service or value. People go into politics because they want to make it. They want to make big box. And therefore, when you leave politics to that state, then you will have large people of impo impoverished, um, pauperized, and humanized. And they will result to violence. And that's why we have violence everywhere. It is so, that vow, the violent expression you are seeing is some level of agitation, higher level of agitation. People have been talking and talking, and the ruling class seem not to be listening. So people have resorted to some violent method to be able to draw attention. But they're still, not, but they're still not listening. They so they were going to. But they're still not listening. So what do we do? In closing, what do we do? The role of stakeholders, I want to know, what is the role or what should stakeholders well, be doing now to salvage well, our economy, what, the security? What stakeholders have been doing is what they, they need to do. Stakeholders have been meeting and they have been drawing attention of government to the decadence in the country.
But beyond that, stakeholders will need, just like the NC front is doing, we need to facilitate a citizens driven, people's driven national consultation and national constitutional dialogue. That's the only way out. The National Assembly must be made immediately to use its powers under Section 4 to bring about a clause, a clause of provision in the 1999 Constitution that can allow for a referendum of the Nigerian people. Okay. The Nigerian people must take back ownership of their country. What is foisted in 1999 is a military structure, it's a military rule. It's still a military constitution. You know, and then you have military pull off their military uniform and then put on the garb of Agbada. So it, nothing has changed. And it will get worse if you go to election this way. So what stakeholders must do is to insist on a brand new people's constitution for the country, in which okay. case the Nigerian peoples will have to meet and say, this is how we want to live together. Okay. And then that will become the ground norm. We need to go. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Olawale Okuni is of the NIM, the National uh, Nigerian Intervention Movement, and Tanko Yunusha is of the National Conscience Party. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for speaking with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll take a short break, and when we come back, two winners emerge as flag bearers in Anambra State PDP. What's the rightful winner? We'll get to find out when we come back. <laughs>